All right, I guess we can get started. It's 4.30. Um, today, I'll be talking about an I.O. scheduler I wrote uh, for while working at Netflix. Uh, my name is Warner Losh, um, and I have the slides on the FreeBSD web server, and also if you access the conference schedule and click through to my talk, the slides are there as well. Uh, and if you could give feedback on the talk, that would be great. That helps me give better talks next year. So here's a, an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why we even bothered to do this at Netflix. We had some problems, and we s solved them a little bit with this. Um, but to understand what I did, I need to give some background on uh, you know, what we do at Netflix and why we would need to solve these problems. Um, these involve SSDs and NAND, which is something I like to talk about, so I put that in. Um, it'll help the understanding. Um, also talk a little bit about FreeBSDs, I.O. stack, and a little bit about CAM. Um, and once I get through all that, I'll talk about what I did to the uh, scheduler for Netflix and um, what some of the results are. And I'll also talk a little bit about um, some stuff I've done more recently. Uh, I put together this talk for Asia BSD Con originally and um, found I only needed to update it a little bit at the end for some of the stuff I've added. So I, I did that. So motivation. Before I started at Netflix, um, we would see every day the servers pumping out video and then when we would add video to the server, when we would fill video into the server, um, there were problems. Um, a big drop in throughput, uh, DevStat was reporting 100% busy, and um, you know, which we, we could handle our, our, our systems dynamically steer based on load, but most worryingly was that um, there were a lot of problems that were showing up in our quality of experience metrics, QOE metrics is what I have on the slide. And those are things that we use to measure how good a quality uh, your Netflix video stream is. I'm going to assume everybody knows what Netflix is and what our streaming service is. I'll talk about how it's implemented here in a little bit. Um, so digging into this, we found that it happened during a content fill. Um, we have a bunch of servers. We put video on them. We stream the video out. Um, some of these servers are offload servers, so they have just the most popular video on them. So uh, every day we change that out a little bit. And in the process of changing that out, there would be these problems. Um, but some days, there'd be no problems. Other days, there'd be big problems. And, we, and nobody knew why. And it's like, hey, Warner, go figure this out. Um, because the operations people just saw graphs like this. This is a graph um, from an older server that's doing, you know, at the peak, 16 gigabits a second. But there are these weird dips here, you know, here and here, same time every day. This is the time that we were filming the videos. And um, uh, it turns out that filling the videos made the SSDs perform poorly for read loads. Um, and we would see these dips. And the operations people don't like to see dips in the network. They like to see nice, smooth graphs and nice, pretty graphs. So um, digging in some more, you see big. the top graph is a graph of the um, writes per second on, all, on each of the individual disks. And you don't need to see all the colors or know which ones they are, but they show big spikes. Normally, there's almost no load, and then boop, 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 big spike. And here's where we caught one um, with the, there's a read spike here and a read spike here. You kind of see one here, and the rest, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, and that was the first clue that we were having some kind of problem that we needed to, to, to look into. And drilling down in, at kind of a, a micro view, um, the R is how much read our system is doing um, in megabytes per second. And you know we're at 120 megabytes, 110 megabytes, which is normal for what our systems were doing at the time. And then here we start to fill. And you see you know, the little W's pop up. And as soon as the W pops up and stays here, 
you see two things. Um, one, the, 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 the read service time goes from, you know, after a few minutes, happy, 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 uh, not so happy, really, really, really bad. And the amount that we're able to read off of this just drops by half. And then we stop writing, and the read rate goes right back up. Now, it doesn't, it's not um, instantaneous backup because our control systems that control the, uh, what load is placed on these servers um, noticed that we had a period of about 20 minutes where things kind of sucked and gave us less load. So um, that's why it took a little while for it to recover. But you know, as soon as we stop writing, you know, the seek times went back to, to normal. This dotted line here represents about five milliseconds, um, which was kind of the benchmark that I had established for um, an acceptable read time, because that's most of the times with an SSD, your read times are half a millisecond to a millisecond. So, you know, 10 times that seemed like a good, a good place to start. So today I'm talking about the I.O. scheduler. But to understand the I.O. scheduler, you need to understand a little bit about CAM. And, and to understand about CAM, you need to understand our, our I.O. stack. Um, in addition, for why the heck we're doing this, you need to understand how SSDs work. And in order to understand how SSDs work, there are these cool devices made from NAND flash that everybody thinks is wonderful, but NAND flash has some issues that the SSDs try to paper over. So to understand why I did what I did, you kind of have to dig down below the surface a little bit and what some of the SSDs are doing to, 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 to really get a feel for you know, why I would even bother, you know, why I would even think um, that I could explain this big dip and why um, I thought I could solve it. And um, you also need to understand the Netflix workload. So that's, um, I guess that's where I'm going to start um, with an overview of the OpenConnect appliance. The, our OpenConnect appliance, we have racks of these things in different data centers. They have different Netflix videos on them that we stream to our customers. Um, each of these systems, this is a slightly newer than the graph that I, a system that I showed on the graph earlier, but each of these systems can do, are, can do on the order of 35, 38 gigabits a second uh, video streaming. And you know, we have stacks of like this in multiple data centers that we use to offload the, the video streams. So all of the video that you're watching doesn't come from Netflix corporate headquarters, it comes from someplace close to your ISP, at least from a network perspective. So what happens when you have a little set-top box or whatever at home and you say, I want to watch this video, um, is that um, the box sends a request to kind of our, um, our control plane, um, basically a server in the cloud that tells it, oh, you want this video. Let me look to see where all the videos are and see which one is close to you. Um, here's a URL for the uh, video that will, uh, that will suit, that will be best for you. And it does this by looking at how loaded the servers are, where the servers are, what offload capacity we have, and all, um, all of these things. And um, it assigns a server. And so then the, once it gets the server, the set-top box goes, oh, give me this video. And there are a number of different algorithms in that say, oh, I'm streaming OK. I'm going to give you a better quality. Or, well, the network conditions are bad. I'm going to degrade quality. But um, ultimately, all of those data streams come off of the OCA appliance, which is nothing but an x86 box. You know, it's rack mounted like I showed in a previous picture. Um, so the other thing that goes on um, inside these OpenConnect appliances is um, every so often we register with the control plane to say, this is my health, we're still here, this is the content I have. And during the day we say, oh, what's today's new content? Or every hour we go, you know, what content do I need to update? So we ask the main control plane, hey, give us, give me a list. So it gives a list of content and that we should have. We don't have it yet. So the 
uh, server goes through its list and goes, oh, I need to delete these things. I need to download these things and this other stuff I don't need to worry about. And we also do some housekeeping where we'll move some things around. We have some slower disks and faster disks in some systems and we'll try to put the less, the less hot content on the slower disks and we'll put the more popular content on the faster disks. Um, so, you know, that gives kind of a flavor for something. So, so most of the time we're streaming video. Sometimes we have to delete uh, videos. So these, the, these, are, these, these systems are nothing more than glorified web servers running in GenX. Um, they've got a whole boatload of files. We have 14 SSDs on our latest flash box where this work is primarily focused on. Um, these SSDs each have a fi their own file system. So if we lose one SSD, we don't lose all the data. We just lose one fourteenth of the data. Um, so it's just a simple UFS on, the, uh, on each SSD. Um, we've tried ZFS, and it doesn't perform as well as UFS. Um, if you want to see me later, I could talk as to why. Um, but we, do, we go with the, what's easy and what performs best, and right now that's UFS. So in a, in, a, in a typical day, to give a rough order of magnitude of the difference between the read and the write, the red in this graph is the, the, the read. As you can see, um, there's quite a bit of disk read. Um, it's almost the entire graph. And there's a little teeny tiny bit of write here um, where we do, um, where we're swapping out the content. And if you squint just right, you can see a little bit of blue. Um, the green on this graph is right, and the, the blue on this graph is trim. And with UFS, when you delete files, uh, it frees the blocks, which sends the trims down to the drive, which you know, is this traffic here. And if you squint really, really hard, you can see that this area here is gray. Um, and that once we start into the gray, we have kind of an exponential back off on, on our read traffic. What's going on here is this is a fill window. This is when we put the stuff on the device. Um, because when people, when we didn't have these, we were noticing the problems that I talked about at the beginning of the talk. So, um, you know, we have, during this time, this guy can't serve video, or can't serve much video. So we, we take him offline, get all the clients out and then put the new video on and then bring them up back online and you can see quickly you know he's ramping up and off to the races again so um, you know we had the fill window to avoid um, avoid these problems now um, it would be better from an operations point of view is if we could write more slowly or do something different in how we write um, that doesn't affect reads you know, we would get back two hours of serving time or three hours of serving time on these, on these servers. And when you have thousands of servers in your network, uh, you know, that can add up to a lot of excess capacity that um, turns into to some, some real dollars if you can find some way to otherwise utilize it. So I mentioned SSDs. Um, SSDs um, are built out of NAND flash. And NAND flash is very difficult to work with if you have to work with it directly. But the SSD vendors have put a nice pretty little face on it and pretend that everything is cool and fine and tells all kinds of horrible lies to you. So you're lulled into a sense of, oh, everything's just cool. There's no problems here at all. I don't have to worry about it. And that's mostly true, except when it's not. Um, and we were hitting one of the except when it's not cases. Um, so to understand how these SSDs are made up, generally there's a whole bunch of chips um, or a whole bunch of uh, parts on the SSD. Each one of these parts have a number of chips in it. Um, you know, so it's hierarchical. Number of chips, each chip has so many erase units. The erase unit is the um, smallest unit you can write or erase to. Now you can write individual pages into the in, into the um, erase unit, um, but you have to write them sequentially. Um, and then each inside of each erase block has a number of pages, and you could read those all day long. 
and it doesn't really affect things. So, you know, this is kind of the hierarchy of what's going on. The key takeaway here are the erase units. The erase blocks are what go bad, and it's the unit that um, when the SSD needs to garbage collect, it operates on erase blocks. So if it needs space for something new, it has to uh, find it from somewhere else. Um, it also means that um, we've got um, a log file system on here. So as we write new blocks, we have uh, old blocks creating holes, and that's why we need to garbage collect. Um, so also while we're erasing, this is what this single uh, uh, duplex, there's no queuing. While we're erasing, we can't do any reads. And erases take a long time. Writes take a long time. Reads are very fast. Reads take tens of microseconds, small number of tens of microseconds. Write takes as long as a millisecond, and erase takes maybe 10 or more milliseconds. So you can see as you need to do each of these things, there's a bigger and bigger impact. Um, the media is also unreliable, so sometimes you get garbage collection activity when you wouldn't expect it because the disks are like, hey, I just read this data and the bit error rate on the data really is bad. Um, so they don't, people don't notice, I'm just going to copy this data to a new block and erase this block and maybe I'll retire it or maybe just erasing it is enough to make it good again. Uh, and so that activity goes on behind the scenes. Um, last year's uh, BSD can talk I gave, I went into a lot more detail about this, but that, that gives you the flavor of, of why we're doing this. Um, this is just a, a block diagram of uh, the SSD. You've got some kind of host connect. Um, this is also the block diagram for an MVME drive. You have some kind of host interconnect. You have a processor that processes um, uh, data. You've got RAM buffers for reading and writing. And then you know, the processor schedules access to the NAND chips through some kind of NAND controller. Um, and the reason you have two layers for that is um, it's good to send transactions down to the NAND controller. Uh, but it really needs to wiggle the, 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 the bits and the, the pins to the chips in a very fast manner. And it's good to, to, to break up the, the logical from the physical. Um, so that's, that's why you have this kind of arrangement. Um, so the flash translation layer, like I said, it tends to enforce a, a log-based file system or a log-based device. Dry, um, uh, so when you write particular logical blocks, um, they don't wind up at that logical block on the physical media. So there's a logical to physical translation. Um, there's also a little bit of extra data that's written alongside the user data to keep track of all of this and um, a bunch of data that may be proprietary to that particular controller, but th there's a little bit of stuff. Firmware also takes care of where leveling. So if you have a DOS file system and are pounding the uh, master block, um, pounding the super block in, in, in a Unix, um, that one block won't get undo where because each time you write it, it winds up in a different place. Um, and the, the where leveling comes in when you've got all these uh, um, erase blocks. Um, there's a small pool of free erase blocks that um, you know, there's a little bit of excess capacity. And they do that, so when you write, there's a, there's a block there to read right away, so you don't have to wait for it, usually. Um, and also, um, over time, the blocks wear out, so they have to be retired. So um, you wouldn't want the first retirement to reduce the capacity of the drive. So that's another lie the drive tells you. It's like, I'm one terabyte. Well, there might be 1.2 or 1.3 terabytes of raw NAND underneath that, but you can't use all of that because as you wear it out, it goes you know, from 1.3 to 1.2 to 1.1 uh, capacity um, underneath the covers, but it still tells the same one terabit lie to the OS. Um, I talked a little bit about the reliability aspect as well. You know, data that's too old gets moved. 
data that reads at a high error rate gets moved. And when they try to use a new block, if there are errors, they have to do something to get that data back. Makes sense, because if you write a block that says, no, I didn't read it, you can't just ignore that. So there's all these things going on behind the scenes, and it, and it generally boils down to garbage collection. You write a block, but it really takes two blocks, or one and a half blocks, of writes to the disk. And when these writes are going on, this extra write um, for garbage collecting, since it's a, you can only do one operation at a time on each of these die, um, you can't, uh, you, don't, you don't get good performance from reads while write activity is going on because different banks are tied up. Sometimes some banks will, won't be tied up, sometimes they won't. It depends on the, uh, you know, it depends on the architecture of the drive. But basically, if, you have a, if you're doing a lot of writes, um, there's a problem. One of the reasons for having trim is to say, throw all of these blocks away at once. So um, if the drive needs to copy you know, a piece of data that has been thrown away, it's real easy. You don't you have to read it. You don't have to write it. It's gone. That's part of the metadata that it keeps around as well, is which blocks have been trimmed out so that it doesn't have to keep track anymore. Um, but all this garbage collection that's going on affects performance, as you, as you might expect. If you're, you know, if you're writing to something that has a particular bandwidth and you're reducing that bandwidth, you're not going to get good write performance. Or if you're expecting to use some of that bandwidth for read and it's busy, well, it's not going to work. So that's, that, that's what's going on in these drives. And that's, that's what was causing the, 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 the spike in latency, is that the particular drive that we have, we talked to the vendor, and he told, they told us that we'll do garbage collection on our drives in the background. Oh, great. When do you do that? Oh, when the interface has been busy for 500 milliseconds or more. Um, if you recall the rather large amount of red that you saw um, on the well, prior graph for our reads, we don't have 500 milliseconds of, of, of downtime. We barely have, um, you know, there's, there's very rarely a time when we go 5 or 10 milliseconds without talking to these drives. So what would happen is while we were writing to do the fill, it's like, oh, I got to catch up. I don't have room for all of this. I have to do all this grooming or all the garbage collection to, to move everything forward. So it was doing that. And we were, um, by writing as fast as we could, we were basically killing any read bandwidth ability or any, any bandwidth available for reads that we would have in the drives. Um, so I found a couple pictures online. Um, if you format a drive and start writing to it, um, doing random writes, everything's cool for a little while, and then you fill up the drive, and then you, you, um, after you fill up the drive, performance drops quite a bit to this big long line. Um, you know, after you've exhausted the initial fill, you know, you get the performance drop as it's um, having to behind the scenes. Uh, um, collapse, you know, do the garbage collection to get blocks to, to satisfy the rights. So that's, that's kind, of a, kind of a physics of what's going on in the drive. Um, so switching gears a little bit, FreeBSD is IO stack, which you kind of need to understand to understand where the scheduler lives. Um, you know, at the top layer, you've got system calls. And going down to the file system uh, with a page cache, um, that's the thing that generates the requests to Geom, which calls the device driver to get the data. Kind of a quick and condensed version of uh, what's going on from uh, George and Kirk's book is where the um, diagram came from. Um, so. There's a number of places that you could do an I.O. scheduler. You could insert a geom module that would mitigate the, that would um, pace the data going down or schedule the data going down. You could um, do something in the cam layer to um, deal with the data. Um, it might, you, know, you might be able to do some stuff in the file system as well. I know uh, ZFS gets a lot of performance benefit by grouping and pacing writes just appropriately so that there's not too much and not too little, but the, they make good bandwidth use of the bandwidth. Um, the scheduler I wrote, and I'll talk about why in a few minutes, lives in the perif driver, or 
the perif driver makes use of the scheduler to figure out what to schedule. Um, any higher in the tree and we wouldn't know what's going on, we wouldn't know the, capacity, the direct capacities of the device, any lower in the tree and we'd have to be changing uh, a, all the HBA drivers, so AHCI, the LSI drivers, um, and all that, and that's, that's too much work. And frankly, that's not the right layer. Um, so talking a little bit more um, about some of the uh, stuff going on at each of these levels. Um, you know, I already said the upper half of the um, driver or the stack generates the requests. Um, John does a good job of filtering data. So if you need to have partitions, so you need to do translation of blocks. If you want to do compression, it's a good place to do compression. If you're doing multiplexing, many to one, one to many, um, to either do striping or mirroring, or did I get that backwards? But either way, um, you know, that does really well. We, we, we even have a scheduler in the geom layer uh, that was tuned to 5,400 RPM disks that a student of Luigi did. Um, but it's kind of limited right now. <clears throat> uh, CAM handles all the queuing. CAM ha has a, a fundamental notion of uh, queues that exist in uh, the devices underneath the CAM layer. It knows how many uh, requests individual HBAs can do. It also knows how many requests we can put down to the individual devices. Um, it enforces uh, different rules of tagged versus non-tagged, which is important for ATA devices or SATA devices. Um, and when necessary, it deals with multiplexing some of these. So if you've got 20 disks that can handle 32 or 64 uh, tags each, but only have 200 uh, transactions in a particular HBA, it can um, multiplex between all of the drives to, to keep them more busy than they would otherwise. There aren't too many devi uh, devices like that anymore, but that's one of the things that, that CAM does. So this is a little bit of an eye chart. I, I go into this in more detail than I'm going to in the talk uh, in my paper. But um, this is kind of the flow that um, the data has through CAM. Each of the perif drivers have a strategy routine that gets called from Geom via a little bit of indirection with uh, an I.O. request. Um, the I.O. request uh, calls bio disk sort to enqueue the, device, the, the, the request or inserts it directly at the end if it's a flash device and we don't need to do um, disk elevator sorting. Um, it then calls uh, DA schedule, or the schedule routine, which calls uh, XPT schedule, um, which checks to see, you know, does this device have a slot, both in terms of the HBA that I talked about and in terms of the disk. Can I give this, more give this disk more data? If I can, um, I call DA start to tell the, the driver, hey, go do stuff. If I can't, I just return. Um, DA start calls BioQ first, which takes the data off of the um, BioQ and submits it to the drive. Uh, for both DA and ADA, we have two queues: um, one for normal read/write IOs, and one and and one for um, trim operations, bio delete operations that translate to trim operations. And the the reason for that is that uh, for SATA. Um, normal IOs um, are taggable, so you can put a whole bunch out and get them back and figure out which one's completed by looking at the tag. Um, they're in CQ um, uh, requests. But for uh, trim device, or for trim commands for SATA, um, those are serialized. You give one, and you can't have any other requests in the drive when you give it, and then it says, okay, I'm coming back, and does that. And the current IO scheduler has, yes, it does. I'll get to that. We don't implement that. <coughs> um, so uh, we have a separate queue for that, so that we do one from that, and then we do a bunch of other requests, and then we do another one from that. We do this little dance between the queues. Um, 
SATA 3 does add um, an NCQ version of the trim, uh, and I've implemented it, but you can only do it for certain um, HBAs. Um, you, you can do it for eight, uh, the AHCI, but you can't do it for like the LSI HBA. And the reason for that is this command is unique of all the commands that we use um, in that there's an auxiliary register that needs to be set. And that auxiliary register, you know, is just a couple of extra bytes in the fizz that you send to the drive. And the AHCI driver, no problem. I'll just, I have those bytes zero right now. I'll just fill those bytes in. Now, there's some interface issues about how to communicate you need this, but um, in the implementation I did that doesn't work, um, you know, it, set a, sets, it sets a flag and then sets the, 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 the bit in there. Um, but for LSI, the, it, it sends it down in a, a SCSI ATA CCB, and that's a fixed size. There's no room for those bits in there. So since you can't set the bit to say to do it, it doesn't do it. So, um, you know, even with modern disks, we can't always do it. Now, the, the implementation I did, you know, it's like fifth on my list that I have three things, time to do three of um, for tracking it down. Uh, but, you know, that, that is something that would help the, the latency in the system. So anyway, getting back to this, you know, DA start passes it down. Um, SIM action is the HBA. Uh, command in the table that um, takes the command and ships it off to hardware. Time passes, an interrupt happens, um, and we wind up going through a chain calling XPT done. And XPT done goes, oh, this peripheral wants to know that this thing is done. So it calls, um, it calls DA done and bio done. Uh, so it calls the, the, basically the done routine that is part of the CCB. And that says, oh, this bio is what was selected. I need to call bio done and tell the, the perif driver that it's done. And the, hello. I've been talking too long on this slide. Um, the perif driver goes, OK, um, I'll call DA schedule. And that'll basically, if I have work, I'll schedule it. Otherwise, I won't. Um, so that's the, the, the kind of the flow uh, that's, that currently is going on in, the, in, in, in CAM. It's kind of a, a little bit of a slog to go through, but um, it took me a while to figure this out and to be able to draw this diagram, and I thought it might be useful for other people trying to approach the code. Like I said, I go into it in more detail in my paper. Um, uh, so... Next, I'll talk about the, the scheduler. Uh, first, the FreeBSD default one, what we do, which I've talked, alluded to a little bit. And then I'll talk about what we do in the Netflix scheduler. Um, right now, there's no differentiation of I.O. All I.O. is treated equal, well, except for, for bio delete, for trims, because they're unequal at the lower levels. Um, and this is the, the default CAM I.O. scheduler. FreeBSD doesn't really have a, a default scheduler at any level. It's just you know, what the block devices implement. Uh, right now, the peripherals implement two orderings. We can either use the disk sort to do the uh, venerable uh, elevator algorithm, which you know, tries to line things up so that if you're, you're, the disk head's here, if the request is in here, it gets done next. Otherwise, it gets put you know, past a marker so that the elevator can go back and, 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 and pick it up. For spinning disks, this, this makes a moderate amount of sense still, even though LBAs aren't strictly ordering. There's kind of a, a strong partial ordering in them. For NAND, it makes no sense at all. It just eats cycles. So we um, also have a, an ordering policy of just doing them in the order we get them. Not that that's guaranteed, but that's just the most convenient and, and, and better performing way. Um, this is implemented in the CAM perif drivers and the DA driver and the ADA driver. It's expressed in line um, in both of those drivers. Um, it's not a lot of code. You know, it's 100, 200 lines of code scattered in a bunch of places. So it's not, um, it's not, it's not too bad. Um, 
so all the scheduling is done there, well, except SATA, again, um, for any NCQ devices, the scheduling is done there, or any NCQ requests. Um, but for a non-NCQ request, the SIM still has to know about it because it's an error to send a, a non-NCQ request while there are NCQ requests pending. It cancels all of them with unpredictable results. So the SIM has to know that there's a non-NCQ request pending and drain all the NCQ requests and then send that and then let the NCQ request back in. So it's not entirely all in the CAM peripheral, but it's mostly there. Um, this generally performs well for most workloads. You know, if, you, if your workload isn't pushing the envelope of what the device can do, it'll work great. Um, if your device is well behaved and has symmetric behavior between reads and writes, even if, you know, writes are always twice as slow as reads or vice versa, it's well behaved. But SSDs break all these rules, you know. If you stress them, you can kind of peer beneath the pretty veneer that they've put on themselves and see some of the, the issues. You can see very asymmetric performance. You can see very, you know, most of the times with disks, when you're writing to them, it'll be the same if you write all day. With SSDs, it'll be good, 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 bad, 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 bad. Maybe eventually good again, you know, depending on how you're cycling through the, the cycle. So you get, um, based on workload with SSDs, you see a much higher variability of underlying performance. And so it doesn't work as well for that, or at least as well as Netflix would have liked. Um, so, you know, this is, again, the graph. You know, and this is the kind of some of the asymmetry. We start writing, and then read performance goes to heck. And the current scheduler doesn't really take that into account at all. It's just like, oh, you've got I.O., here you go. I want to be the most efficient pipe to the lower layers I can be. And that's what it's focused on. I want to follow all the rules for the pipe to the lower levels. And, uh, and that, and Generally, that's what you want, except when you have weird behavior like this. So, the Netflix I.O. scheduler. Um, one of the things that we want to try to do is reduce the rate that write amplification happens. If we can reduce the rate that write amplification happens, that gives us more read bandwidth in the drives. So, if we need to write a gigabyte of data, rather than writing it all at once and not having any bandwidth, we space it out. We also want to schedule fewer concurrent writes um, to the drive. Scheduling fewer concurrent writes will um, mean that fewer banks are busy with writes and more banks are available for reads. Um, depending on the drive firmware, this is, you know, this is a very firmware dependent um, assumption. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't with the drives that we have. Um, we're willing to trade a little bit of elevated read latency um, and we don't care about the right performance to a point. So we're, we're able to make some trade-offs like, well, if we write this fast, we have this latency. Well, we can tolerate some more loss so we can write a little faster or maybe we have to write slower based on on what the latency winds up being. And as I, as I talked about earlier, um, you know, geom is too high in the stack. Um, it, it, can't, it doesn't know what's available in the lower levels. It can't make individual measurements about how long each I.O. takes. It can't really, it, it's not really in the position to have the, the knowledge that it needs to um, effectively schedule things. <clears throat> so, I did some changes to our I.O. scheduler. Um, I created an abstract interface so that we abstracted the different I.O. scheduler bits into a set of calls. Um, this is a layer of indirection in a driver that has lots of indirection. Um, so on the one hand, you could argue, wow, you've made it more like the rest of the driver. Good. On the other hand, you can go, wow, you've made another place where I have to indirect to find out what's going on bad. So, you know, there are pros and cons depending on your point of view and people tend to polarize to one extreme or the other when, when, when talking about this. Um, so I did, so I, I'm kind of of the camp that duplicated code is bad code. Uh, and I also didn't want to implement this twice because 
there's a, a lot of sophistication I wanted to put in, and I wanted just to create a library. And I always schedule a library. You call into it, and you can replace the library um, to get different uh, sorts of behavior or implement different scheduling things. I converted DA and ADA to the new interface because that's all the device drivers that we have in the tree that are uh, perifs. Um, and I stopped there and did a bunch of testing and made sure there was no regressions because the last thing I wanted with my OS, my OS scheduler was, oh, I introduced a problem when I abstracted and I didn't detect it until I'm on my new algorithms. Now, are they problems with my algorithms or where? And I just wanted to constrain what was going on. It also makes it easier to commit upstream if I can say, if you don't take any of the Netflix changes or Netflix specific dry, uh, schedulers stuff, there's no change. You know, it behaves the same, it's tested the same. Um, it's a low risk thing, even if it does, you know, move some code around. Um, for the Netflix scheduler then, I made sure that we had separate queues for reads and writes and deletes. Um, and I collected a lot of statistics. How long does this, has this device, or um, how long do the reads spend in the sim or lower, basically in the device? Um, and I keep a, a running average, a run an exponential average of that um, for reads and writes and trims. Um, you know, number of reads, number of writes, all that stuff. All the statistics are kept so I can, uh, in trying to figure out what to do next, I can look at those statistics and say, you know, the read latency is fine, I don't need to worry about writes, or the read latency is terrible, I do need to worry about writes. I could make those decisions. Now, I don't have to make that decision, but I had the data I need to make the decision. Um, I added the ability to limit the number of IOs in the device in the first round of the work. In the second round of the work, I also added bandwidth limiting and IOPS limiting. And you can pick one of the three. You can either say, I don't want you to schedule more than two writes to the device, or I don't want you to schedule more than 20 megabytes to the device. Both of these are, are, are valid things to say. You can't put an and between those. You either get IO, IOPS or bandwidth or Q depth, but not all of them at once. Um, this was for simplicity of implementation, but it might turn out we need something like that. Um, you know, plus some adjustments to the code that I didn't get right on my first iteration. Uh, so looking at this, this diagram that I had up here before, um, the changes are in red. So rather than calling disk sort directly, it calls schedule work. And the schedule work is part of the library that's responsible for keeping track of where that work is. Um, I broke up into multiple queues in the library for you know, the Netflix scheduler. Um, if you want to have your own schedule, you're free to do whatever you want there. Um, and then I had um, a routine next bio that DA start calls to get what the next bio is. So the DA driver is no longer deciding what the next IO to do is. It's the um, CAM IO scheduler library that's deciding that. Um, and I also had to um, because I'm limiting I.O., um, I had to add calls to DA schedule from DA done uh, so that we wouldn't freeze the queue. If I've artificially frozen the queue, um, the rest of CAM doesn't know that. So when I, artificial, so when I remove the constraints um, where the, the, the queue is frozen, I need to um, call XPT schedule because CAM doesn't know to do that for me automatically. So I had, to, I had to add a call from DA done to DA schedule or that uh, did that. And, and for all of these diagrams, DA and ADA, I made the same changes. Um, so it, it, I didn't really change a lot in the, in, in the flow, just abstracted it. And most of the changes are basically in this column, where we decide what to do. And, how we do it is, is, largely unaf is largely unchanged. So here's another run um, where we do a fill. Um, and we start out at a lower rate, but that's just an accident of when I did the test. 
Netflix video load varies from day to day. The day before House of Cards is released is much lower than the day after the new season of House of Cards is released. And this was a slow day. Um, but you'll see, instead of having the big spikes up into this range for writes, we have one big spike and then it comes down and it's generally under 20 megabytes. And we have a couple of pop, you know, a couple of things going up above the tolerance level I set for the read I.O., but generally limiting the Q depth to one, which is what this test shows, um, you know, kept the right amplification effects low, so we don't really see a change in the, the, the bandwidth that we're, that we're doing. And again, I think I, this was at a different time of day, and the first graph was for an hour, and this graph is for three hours, so you see more variation in load. Um, so uh, putting all these together, we get you know, something like this. So um, <clears throat> so after I got these results, I kept tinkering with this, adding bandwidth limits like I talked about earlier. Um, to do that, though, if you're just queuing individually, I'm only going to put three items in the queue at a time or one item in the queue at a the time. There's no time domain there. You keep a count, you send one down, you decrement the count of what's available. It's very simple. But trying to say, I'm going to do more than 20 megabytes a second, you can't do that anymore. You have to have a clock ticking to, to, to figure out how much you've sent, or you have to have a quota of how much can be sent, and you deduct from that quota as you send the, the data down. And when it reaches zero, you send more down. And then every so often, you have a timer go off and replenish the quota and see if there's any, any thing that's stuck in the queue and kicks off the, the I.O. Um, so I implemented both static and dynamic steering of limits. The static steering of limits was you can have 20 megabytes. The dynamic steering of limits tried to say, well, if the read latency is a millisecond or low, bump up how much write bandwidth you can have. If the read latency is above five milliseconds, these are just arbitrary numbers I picked, bump down the write, uh, the amount of writes that you're allowed to send down. Um, <clears throat> so basically, to do that, I just had to change two places. I had to add a ticker to replenish the quota, and then I had to do IO schedule next to look at the quota to do that. Um, and I got this done last week, and I wanted to put it in the talk, but I don't have fancy graphs to show what's going on. Um, generally, the results show that uh, the static limits uh, work predictably, um, and they're either always good or always bad. The dynamic limits, it turns out, um, the statistics I take, took are averaged over several hundred seconds. The, as you saw in earlier graphs, the dynamics of the device change second to second. So if I'm gathering a statistic that's the average of the last thousand seconds, I'm not going to steer quickly enough to affect the change. So I steer too slowly, and I wind up being stuck at the rails and having sucky performance. And that's the other reason I didn't want to do graphs. I, 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 I didn't want to throw stuff like that up. So there's still some more work that I need to do on this, but um, that's, that's kind of where things are. And uh, in my paper, um, since I've been working on code, I haven't been working on my paper. So I worked on it a lot for Asia BSDCon. And then the addition since then, I added in, a, in an appendix in the paper. Um, I haven't gone back and reintegrated it. I'm, since I need to do more tuning, um, I was going to wait till I had done that tuning to, 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 to update that. Um, some issues that popped up were that if I'm rate limiting, given how DevStat polls uh, looks at I.O. completions, if I keep something in the queue for a long time, that counts as it being busy, even though it's not. So um, I could be writing to the disk, rate limited to 10 megabytes a second, have plenty of read bandwidth, but it's reporting, um, DevStat is reporting 100% used. That's no good. At least for our application, we take DevStat and say, uh, um, and say well, we want 90% or less. Anything above that, it saturates the, the device and it's no good. So we want to keep it at 90% or less. This was kind of an arbitrary decision because we needed to steer the device somehow. 
And that works great if you're not artificially constraining it, but if you're artificially constraining it, it also doesn't work. So we need to come up with a new metric to do that um, because DevStat operates at the geom layer well above where we are in the tree. So <clears throat> either we need to somehow tell geom that we're doing this or uh, something. So, so those are the issues that I noticed. The other issue is that um, with UFS, it wakes up every so often and says, here are all the dirty pages. It would be nice if I could tell it, hey, look, don't give, them, don't give me these pages more than this rate, because that way the, the, the write queues don't get clogged and the latency for individual writes isn't as large. And perhaps it could also do some more intelligent scheduling of writes. Oh, these writes have overtaken each other. They don't need to be written, whatever. Um, that's an area that's an idea at this point, a good research area if anybody's interested, but not something that's actually been implemented. So that brings me to the end of my time, uh, kind of. I've got a few minutes for questions, if anybody has some questions. Kirk asked a very good question that I was going to put in my talk, which is, oh, if you could only have one I.O. scheduler, wouldn't you want different ones for different things? Um, and I answered that, well, yeah, that's kind of bad. That kind of sucks. But really, you have the scheduler, but it can implement different policies. And the scheduler would implement the different policies, which you can set individually per disk. Um, so it could implement one policy for this disk, which is read-only, and one policy for this disk, which is a read-write mix maybe even with different file systems. So um, that's how, you know, you would have one I.O. scheduler, but, um, you know, it would implement the range of policies that you would want for a diversity of workload. So other questions? Here. Mm -hmm. We did consider that. That, 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 that. that is one way to deal with this. The problem with that is um, that uh, one, our steering loop from the control plane uh, operates minute by minute. And that's much longer than half a second. The other is that um, as we're streaming data, um, the devices don't actually go back to the control plane. They go, oh, I've got a good server. I'll get the next one. And if it's not there, it would see a half a second latency, which would give you the nice little rebuffering dial. Um, so we wouldn't, we wouldn't want that. These devices have very limited amount of memory, and they're getting you know, just a few frames worth of data. Um, and to introduce a, a half a second delay into that would, would, would affect the quality of experience metri matrix that, that, that we had. So right, exactly. Yeah, so, that, so, so you know, if, if, we, if the clients could tolerate it, that would be great. If it was like 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds, you know, we would run the experiment. But since it was so long, and it's 500 milliseconds before it starts the garbage collection, and we asked the vendor, how long does the garbage collection take? Oh, we don't know. Well, how long is in a we don't know? Well, hundreds of milliseconds was the answer we finally got back after a lot of back and forth. So it's not really half a second. It's a second to a second and a half. And, you know, that was non-deterministic that we couldn't find the end of, you know. So that was another reason that we went down this path rather than trying to hold off the I.O. for a while. But that, that is a good question. If other workloads, that would be the easier solution. Yes? Yes. Um, so the bulk of my experience has been with Micron SSDs. Um, I think that was disclosed in another talk. Uh, hopefully I'm not sharing <laughs> company secrets here. Um, and they perform adequately well. 
um, but we buy the consumer grade, not the enterprise grade. And so we have issues like, like, like we're seeing here. Um, other vendors uh, that we haven't bought heavily from behave about the same ways. Um, some of them hide the grooming or the garbage collection activity a little better than others. Um, I don't really have personal recommendations because as part of this, it was let's use what we have in our, our infrastructure, which tends to be a little bit of a monoculture, rather than you know, let me get all these SSDs and, and find. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I can't help you with that. So let's go over here. To, I'll go back and forth. Right. Well, yeah, it would, it would absolutely change those parameters because the less asymmetric performance you get out of the drive, the less you can do with scheduling. Um, to your point, the um, enterprise devices tend to uh, create, um, tend to have more, more buffer and the processor is more capable. So they're able to do more sophisticated algorithms. They're able to buffer data longer. In addition to the RAM over provisioning, they also usually give you better RAM so it doesn't go bad as fast. So there's less background garbage collection going on. So. <coughs> yeah. That's something that exists primarily uh, in slideware today. <laughs> um, and f super cap uh, almost every SSD or NVRAM has a super cap or a battery to back it up because otherwise the right guarantees just can't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh? Okay. There's another question over here. Yeah. So based on your original uh, next. Uh, based on the original description of the problem, it almost seems like it's kind of working around an issue that's really in the SSD. Yeah. I'm curious if you ever approached the SSD manufacturer and said, "Look, like we want, we want." <coughs> Um, Micron listened to us and basically told us, uh, thank you, <laughs> um, for the suggestion. Um, it turns out that they, the, the processor that they have in the devices that we bought was not capable enough uh, for them to, to, to do the background stuff. Um, and they could bring in the timers a little bit, but not enough to meet our needs. Um, so we certainly, for new, for, for new devices that we're buying, we're, we're absolutely talking to them about, can we control the garbage collection? Can we tell you, this is a good time to do more, or this is a bad time, or can you tell us this is a good time to write or a bad time to write? Um, and, and get 
you know, peel back the veneer of their uh, FTL a little bit to, to expose some of this. And some vendors have been very forthcoming, and some vendors have told us to pound sand. We have the entire range of responses. So in the back and then over here. Yeah, set capacity, yeah. You basically say, okay, the SSD, the SSD actually has this much man, but it only advertises this much man, and the, bulk, and the remainder is internally used for, for over provisioning. Just all the enterprise devices are like this. Well, no, they do a lot more with other fancy stuff and firmware too. Uh, but in any case, so this is how much the, the drive tells you about. Then you can send a command which says set max LBA, which basically tells the drive, I am never going to use more than this much NAND. The, the SSD then uses the, the, the rest of the NAND that it advertises. It says, okay, well, you're swearing that, that you are never going to put anything in, this, in these blocks. Therefore, I can treat this as extra open capacity as well. And that way, it has more uh, uh, spare sectors that, uh, that it can use when doing garbage collection. You can, in FreeBSD, even if you, the drive doesn't support the set maximum LBA command, you can um, never use more than 80% and make sure the rest is trimmed. It's not as good. Yes. Yes. You have to make sure the rest is trimmed, though. Right. That's the important part because <clears throat> uh, that is hard to do. The other thing, I think, with, with set max is once you use set max, you still have to do uh, secure rating. Yes. Exactly right. you, have yes. To, you have to do a secure erase and then. You can't like do a shrink. You can't like shrink FS right. and then set it. You have to do a secure erase, and so for the us, up, for, operationally for us, that's right. impossible. The part here is this is not something you chain with, you know, GPT, and you say, oh, well, I'm going to only partition, you know, the first half. That's not good enough. You actually have to use set max or something like that, or trim or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it varies from drive to drive. The efficacy of those efforts. I've implemented NCQ trim. It works great until the drive becomes corrupted, which tells me that my implementation is flawed in a way that I have not detected. Um, I saw um, for AHC. Okay, so. Normally, we see for AHCI, we see about a three millisecond latency per request. And on uh, LSI, we see about a one or a one and a half millisecond um, latency per request. And implementing NCQ trim uh, on the drives that we were writing to all the time that had both video and log files on them, I saw that the, 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 the three milliseconds went to one and a half to two milliseconds. So it improved it. It was useful. But if it was corrupting the drive, it, it's, it's not worth deploying into production, unless I hate my ops guys. <laughs> uh, I actually like all the ops guys we have now. They haven't pissed me off. <laughs> Lawrence, that we have now. <laughs> Right, and that is true. That that's true both in ATA and in SCSI. It's an it's an advisory request. It's not a get rid of this data. Although 
um, it might make the data inaccessible. So it's actually in the NAND, but right. when you read it, it returns zero. And there's little bits in the, in the identify that says zero, ones, or who knows. Yeah, yeah. Right. But, but, it, but it is a, it is a, a request. Now, some drives, firmware, the reason it takes so long for the trim to come back, they do something. It tells you what it's going to do. You can't ask it to do anything different. Right, right, right. Yes. Short answer, yes. Long answer, yes, with the usual reviews and so forth. Um, it's in, in, in my paper, I have a pointer to the code I've, I've committed already to the tree um, in a project branch, which also has the flawed NCQ implementation if somebody wants to tell me my bug. Not that I expect them to do that, but some people take great pleasure in that, and I'd like to give them the opportunity. Um, but that only has... Um, through, uh, it, it only has the Q depth limiter. It doesn't have the bandwidth or other stuff. Okay. I was planning on committing that. I ran out of time. Sure. So um, I'd like to get into FreeBSD. I'd maybe even get the Netflix one in um, as an example. Um, but I haven't, I haven't climbed that hill yet because I'd like to get to done with a good working example that has a lot of air miles in production. And even though um, I was kind of done with the scheduler back in uh, March so I could present at Asia BSDCon, it was only in um, mid-May that we started using it on hundreds of machines, you know, a, some small percentage of our machines in production, um, you know, that we threw the switch and started using it. Um, and now that we've done that, I have more confidence and I'm more interested in committing it um, as well. So there, there, there have been two delays. I'm not trying to to keep the code. I just haven't, you know, it takes time to do it right. Of course. Thank you. That's Lawrence. <clears throat> okay, so what the ticker does is it does two things. Um, it is, it's just a call out that gets called and it read arms the call out. So it's, it's doing that 20, 50 times a second, depending on how big a quantum you want. It takes the bandwidth that you have and divides it by that number um, and sets that as the amount of I.O. you're allowed to do. And then each I.O. says, oh, this is a one megabyte request. Do I have any left? Yes. Do the request and deduct that from the, from, from the quota. No, not, uh, not necessarily. Right, right. There's, there's no, there's, I didn't do it that way is the reason, uh, which is a kind of a weak reason. Um, I didn't want, the, the, a slightly stronger reason would be I didn't want to put the, you know, the, the quota computations in line with the fast path and the, the done path is part of the fast path. So I was a little scared of that. I didn't measure it to see if it would be a problem but I was afraid, so I did it this other way. Um, yeah, well, the other thing I wanted to do was do more sophisticated analysis of, you know, every second for the dynamic steering, we look at a bunch of different things and do some math um, that eventually might be pretty heavyweight math to say, oh, in the next second, I can only do 20 megabytes a second instead of the 25 I'm doing now, or I can do 30, you know making those decisions would be more heavyweight. And I don't want to do that and delay an individual I.O. I want to do that kind of offline to that or asynchronous to that process. So uh, it, probably, it, it probably could. I just didn't do it that way. 
Any other questions? All right, thank you for coming.